My name's Jason, I'm from Grimsby, and I sell business insurance. <laughs> I can actually feel your heart sink when you think you've got to spend 20 minutes with me talking about that. That's kind of the point I want to make today. If that was a Match.com profile, that guy would never get a date. <laughs> I, actually didn't, I actually didn't realise how bad that picture would look at that sort of scale. Um, note to self, not use that again. But yeah, like Richard said, so I've been at Match.com. Uh, I used to run that business across Europe. Um, I was at LastMinute.com where I ran a couple of the entities there. I've also been involved with a business called Skyscanner as a non-exec director and an investor. And I used to be on the board of the Drink Aware Trust, which was trying to change drinking attitudes in the UK. So I've been trying to learn about digital over the last few years. And guess what I want to talk about for the next 20 minutes is really about my perspective on the market changes that most of you will know this already, so I'm not going to tell you anything new. And then just how we approach it at Simply Business. So when I think about what's happening today, I've just spent a week, a couple, uh, last week actually, in Silicon Valley. Have you heard of Singularity University, anybody? So Singularity University, you should look this up, because essentially, if you want to think about the most innovative organizations in the world, this is a new university based in Silicon Valley. And the premise of the guys that also run the X Prize, and if you haven't heard of the X Prize, it's the guys that essentially are used in private enterprise to solve large world problems. I can talk for days about this, but essentially, the concept is about the exponential growth and period of time and history that we're living through at the moment. So you'll all know this as a linear thinkers that we are as humans. If you go 30 steps, you get 30 steps away. If you go exponentially, which is basically a doubling each time, it's a billion. And the period that we've lived through in the last 20 years in particular, most personified by Moore's law, which you all know, the doubling of capacity and price over 18 months, which is going to end, by the way, in the next five years. But that best typifies exponential thinking. And the last 20 years for us is absolutely about this curve and has been about here on many technologies. So I'll share these slides with anyone that wants them, but it's basically about biotech, about uh, nanotechnology, about DNA, DNA sequencing, about quantum computers, fascinating array of stuff. And we're living through that new industrial revolution. But you know this, I mean, anyone that was born in the 70s as I was, this, this used to be the primary source of communication. It used to double as a urinal late at night as well. But essentially, I remember a phone being fitted in my house in the 70s. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous to talk to kids these days. We've lived through that revolution. And yet, this is my two-year-old son now. Any of you with kids will recognise this, not my son obviously, but you'll recognise the image, which is you put an iPad in front of a kid, they will pick it up and they'll naturally take to that. And you haven't got kids, don't call social services. This is normal behaviour for a two-year-old kid these days. And I just want to show you this ad actually. I saw this last week while I was in the States, but this kind of typifies that exponential curve that we're going through and the attitude towards, towards change. Unbelievable. In our yeah, day, we didn't have our babysitters yeah. yeah, our babysitters didn't have any place to sit on the school ladder. And I always worried that I was creating an overcrowded sheep farm. In my head, never went that far to a public care of sheep. Too much. The pace of change is speeding up. So even between three or four years of kids now, the technology is moving on at that rate. I think we can all capitalise on that. This is borrowed from a guy called Leonard Brody who thinks we're living through something called the pixelated era. Does anybody, has anybody seen this image before? It's fascinating. This is a picture taken in 2005 at the inauguration or whatever you call it when a pope comes into office, um, uh, Pope Benedict. And then 2013, so eight years later, and it just kind of shows that the technology has become pervasive in a really short space of time. And you know this, but the iPad down there, does anybody remember um, when the iPad was actually launched? When was that? 2010, it's three years old. It's, two th it's three years old and it's pervasive in our lives today. That pace is just rapidly, rapidly gathering speed. And brands are talking to us differently these days as well. I mean, these are from the 70s. Uh, I borrowed these from a guy, ex-CMO of um, Virgin America, a guy called Alex Hunter that you should look up. He does great work on branding. And I don't think anyone's been malicious, but brands used to talk to us in a one-way one -way conversation. Um, I can't imagine the advertising standards having all kinds of fun saying your kids telling you to have a cigarette to calm down before you scold them. And this one's my favourite. I, I, I don't even know what this means, but um, <laughs> I can imagine someone going on a Match.com date and thinking, yeah, I'll try that. Let's see if that gets me a second date. Probably not. And where's this going now? I think, you know, we're in the home of Google, but you think about that one-way conversation people were having with brands. And today, as we come into the world where glass is going to become more relevant, it's going to be about personalised data. 
locally, location specific, and it won't be even like serving ads. It'll be really about serving answers to questions that you have as you go through your day-to-day -day life. So the interaction with brands and businesses is changing beyond all recognition. So for me, and that's, again, I'll talk very personally about how we approach this at Simply Business. It really means, and Hannah talked on this a little bit, is, is you know, in, I'm not sure that I actually agree. We come to it on the panel about emotional connection with brands, by the way. I don't think that exists. I think the way that people interact with businesses is not on an emotional level. That's, that's marketing BS created for, to keep us in jobs, basically. But I can, we can talk a bit about that offline later. But what is absolutely true is, you know, people demand more dialogue, more openness, more transparency. And I think you've got to be authentic these days. You can't fake it. And that's what, essentially what we're trying to do in a really boring industry. So when this comes to innovation, I get quite uncomfortable. I was quite uncomfortable to be asked to talk about innovation today because I think it's quite a hackneyed phrase. I'm not sure what people know what it means anymore. Um, guy on the left, Elon Musk, one of my heroes, inventor of SpaceX, he's doing the Hyperloop stuff, the Tesla stuff, awesome. And Larry Page, I think he's doing quite well as well. But essentially, when you think of innovation, you think of these global thinkers that are changing the world on a dramatic scale, or even on, on a global uh, intergalactic scale when the asteroid mine that Larry Page is now investing in. And actually, when we think about innovation, there are, depending on who you look and who you talk to, there's an institute called Dobin, they're, 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 I think they're called Monitor now in the US, but they wrote a, book, wrote a book about the 10 different types of innovation. I think that's how I try to relate to it, is how do I, how do I think about innovation, someone from Grimsby, someone that's not technically trained, but how do we think about trying to change marketplace? And if we're capable of it, I think everyone in this room is definitely capable of it. There's also something, I think Hannah touched on this as well, interestingly, this is um, work taken from Daniel Kahneman, but I don't think it's particularly original. A lot of um, psychologists have talked about this over the years. When we think about innovation, we often think about what we call cognitive bias, which is we tend to amplify the risk in a program and actually discount the reward. I think being aware of that and recognising that when you think of trying to change a market or trying to change a landscape is particularly important as well. So up and down the country, there'll be creative writing class classes tonight where um, teachers are telling their students to write what they know. I think this, this is a quote accredited to Mark Twain. So how we think about it is simply business is you've got to build on what you know. So take your whole experience and use that to essentially think about new markets and new opportunities. So Richard mentioned I was at lastminute.com previously. And essentially, lastminute.com, along with Expedia, Travelocity, and all those great brands, disintermediated the travel agent by trying to provide services that connected people into hotels and airlines. You all know this. Match.com tried to connect people with more opportunities to find love. And the previous opportunities were the pub, the newspaper, or your mum. I'm not sure which one of those is the worst. Maybe a combination in the pub with your mum, reading a newspaper. But the point is, is that we're trying to use technology to connect people in the same old way they've been connecting for thousands of years. But technology and digital media was a way of trying to encourage that type of behaviour. So when we thought about Simply Business, what we think is it's an even perfect market for disruption. And it's perfect because it's a product that consumers want. They actually don't like the product, they don't understand it, and they don't really understand the value. So it's the only product you buy that you hope you never need. So for us, there's a real opportunity to put the value and the, the control back into the consumer's hands. You take that alongside the fact that the UK small business insurance market is valued at £6 billion today. 90% of those transactions occur offline. And brokers, who you're buying your policies through, make up to 35% commission for not doing a lot generally. And I don't think it's willful. People are trying to not service customers or think about ways in which they can rip people off. But actually, there's a new way of working with that transparency, openness, and um, focus on the customer. So how do we do it? And I've got a couple of other slides to go. There's no secret source around this. So really, the components and the constituent parts of our business are very, very obvious. I'd like many things I'm saying today, by the way. If you're interested in this stuff, Eric Rees writes a lot about what we do in a book called The Lean Startup. We've completely plagiarised that. Um, John Hagel, he's a philosopher and thinker um, at the Edge Institute in California. A lot of the thinking comes from that. Clayton Christensen, who wrote a great book called The Innovator's Dilemma. I'll steer you all towards this if you're interested, but none of this is new. The constituent parts of our business are very obvious. We've got great technologists led by Lucas, who's here today, our CTO. We're pretty good at digital marketing. We know how to work with Google as we've done that over a number of years. We're passionate about putting the power back into the customer's hands and building products around real insight. And ultimately, product creation is about our underwriting expertise and our desire to use data 
to build hypotheses that can move our business forward. So my final slide is a little bit of the magic to think that what we do differently. And again, this can be lent to all of your businesses. So these are the five rules that we run the business by. The one team rule is quite simple. So we don't have siloed functions in our business. So we don't have technology and finance and customer service. We put people together on cross, as cross-functional teams to solve a problem. So there's two reasons we do that. One, we believe it's a more interesting way of working. But more importantly, it very specifically addresses the way you get the intellectual capacity out of everyone in your business to work on specific problems. So I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of years ago, um, one of the hackathons that Hannah mentioned, so we do this actually twice weekly, where anyone in the business can pitch an idea and we all vote on it. It's not my decision, we all vote on it as a group. And if it's a good enough idea, they get the resource to work on that for two weeks. And one of our guys two, weeks ago, um, two years ago um, said we needed a better mobile platform. So they went away and they built a the mobile platform. Two weeks later, it's live. And it hasn't changed much in the last couple of years. We've won awards for it. That tells you how low the bar is in the insurance industry, by the way, rather than the quality of our mobile platform, because you start to look at it. Um, but importantly, that's 30% of our traffic today runs through our mobile platform. That was essentially an idea from someone on marketing, a girl called Petra, and a great developer that we've got called Pisa. Don't build the machine. This is entirely Lucas's work. So when we think about being partly a technology company, and we're passionate about technology, we often think about what's the end solution that we can build to in an old waterfall model. And that doesn't work today, we don't think, because it's not efficient. So we always think on these cross-functional teams about what is the specific problem we're solving? And then we build metallic mechanical Turks. So essentially, we make it look like it's automated, and it's people doing that work. And then we use the technology to automate the most important things that that process throws up. So another good example of this, we put a continuous cover in place for our customers. And we were like, well, will our customers want it? Will they like it? Is it useful? We didn't know is the honest answer. We could have gone away and built that, but we don't know. So we built a system with people that looked like to a customer, they were getting their policy auto renewed. And we found that one, customers liked it, and two, actually, they don't want to talk to us. They want the policy to be right at this inception, and then they want us to go away. They hope they never speak to us again. So we then spent six months with the team automating the, the, the touch points on that process, and we probably got there in six months, a project that would probably take in a couple of years if we just built it from day one. So we don't build the machine. We start off talking to our customers, build a hypothesis, which is the next point. Everyone in our business is a scientist, not in the way I've got a philosophy degree, so I'm not very scientific, but everything we do is based around a hypothesis and a measure. So there's some things in the business we just have to do and they get built, but most of the new projects that we're doing, we test a hypothesis and build the minimum viable products to get data back to see whether we go deeper into that. The fourth one, I saw a really, really depressing statistic in the US last week. It was a Deloitte study that said only 11% of people that work for businesses today are passionate about the business that they work for. And that's a hugely uh, underutilized resource, I think. If you know people can't get excited about the mainstay of where we spend our day, then that's disappointing. There's all kinds of challenges we've got about how we employ people as things become automated over the next 20 years. But that's another subject. But today, I think, you know, just allowing people to be the owners of your business, the owners of your intent and your day-to-day -day activity means that they're responsible for their own passion and their own interest, and they follow those to come up with hypotheses. Our job as the leadership of the business is to set the strategic direction, but actually people are smarter than you. They'll work the direction out how to get there a lot quicker than you can as a senior team. So it's having that faith in the quality of people that you've got and allowing them to be excited about the direction you're going in. And then the final point is about being open and transparent. Um, we believe in it, we live it. You know, we've got a community on Twitter of about 27,000 Twitter followers today. You know, for an insurance brand, that's ridiculous. For an insurance broker, it's insane, quite frankly. But we care and we're honest and we're transparent about what we do. We're not perfect, but we're on a direction whereby we think we can change the landscape of the insurance market. John Hagel talks again about the most important characteristic of a business in the 21st century is your ability to adapt and change over time. And that's really important. It's not about having a, a roadmap knowing exactly where you're going to be at the right time. The world moves on too quickly for that. So getting feedback and being open to that criticism, that debate, is a really important characteristic. It's also a good way to live your life, I think. So on that note, um, I'm done. And on the open and transparency um, piece, um, every second week in our business, on a Wednesday, we have what's called a show and tell. 
where we talk about the stories that we've done in the previous two weeks and collectively we decide on what we're going to do in the next two weeks. And that's an open meeting that we've had our competitors come to. We've had multiple, I think actually Shilpa's here today from Aldermore, um, who's one of our, our co-owned in, in the private equity company owns us. So, the, so her team came and saw what we do. So everyone in this room is invited to that. Not at the same time, obviously, but if you want to come genuinely, come and see how we do this. It's not secret, There's no execution is everything, but if you want to learn a little bit more about how we do this, drop me a note, I'm at Jay Stockwood on Twitter, and um, we'd be more than happy to come and spend a morning with us and see how we interact with both people that work with us and our customers at the same time. We're not perfect, as we say, but we're open to that feedback. So I guess my overall message, if someone from Grimsby can try and change the world of business insurance, and you've got a lot better brands and businesses in this room today, I think there's a big bit of the world that you're all going to change. So thank you for your time.